All right, Sirius Omer is uh, it, it's one of the uh, misconceptions, it's one of the most common misconceptions in Jewish in Jewish life, is uh, Sirius Omer. Sirius Omer, which means literally the counting of the Omer. And the counting of the Omer is that we start the day after Pesach, we start counting up to Shavuos. Now, most people know Sirius Omer as a period of mourning. People think of Sirius Omer, and we got to. Can't listen to music. If you ask somebody what does Sirius Omer mean, most people say Sirius Omer means you can't listen to music, which is not true. Sirius Omer, the counting of the Omer, is a Torah command that you start counting days from the second day of Pesach, commencing with Shavuos, which is Pentecost. And we count, we count all the way up. The idea of counting from after Pesach, Passover, counting to Shavuos is they had in the 70s. So those of you who remember, those of you who are old enough to remember, in the 70s they had the Russian jury, Russian jury were trapped. And they had free Soviet jury. There were a lot of rallies to free Soviet jury. And a bumper sticker came out that said, let my people go. Shlach et ami. Remember that? The bumper sticker said, shlach et ami. Then the religious version of the bumper stickers came out where they added one word, which was shalach et ami v'yavduni, send out my people that they may serve me. That's, a, that's all the difference right there. There's send out my, let my people go, and let my people go that they may serve me. That means that freedom, Pesach we get free. I mean, we get free from cleaning for Pesach, that for sure. And then we get free after Pesach, there's, there's a certain freedom. And in the historical sense, the Jewish people obviously got freed from Egypt. They got freed from Mitzrayim. So the freedom, imagine a guy who's in prison, a guy's in jail, and we let him go. A guy's in jail 20 years, and we let him go, and he has nowhere to go when he leaves jail. So the guy's going to leave jail. What's he going to do? Chances are he's going to have to make a parnosa. He's going to have to earn a livelihood as fast as possible. The most efficient way of doing that is robbing a bank. So he's going to just end up right back where he came from. Freedom without a purpose, you're better off not being free. So Svira Omer tells us, count the days from Pesach until Shavuos, because there's a link. You have to link up. Because the entire purpose of the freedom on Pesach, to get free in Egypt, the whole idea was to get free so that we could then be in a state where we can receive the Torah, and now we submit ourselves to God's will on a spiritual level. That means we are no longer in physical bondage in, in, in Mitzrayim. We have to now accept the Torah, and now we are free. If we're in Egypt and you have a master, a pharaoh, Paro, who is uh, uh, oppressing you, then you're not free to go off and make a commitment to serve God the way you would want to serve God. So that is the real purpose of the counting of the Omer. Now what happens is because Rabbi Akiva's disciples died, Rabbi Kiva's Talmidim died during this fear period, so we associate Sirius Omer with what we can't do, which is how we often live life. What can't I do? What can't I eat? And you know, all right, we're always the pessimists. What can't we do? Can't listen to music, you can't shave. But that's not accurate because Sirius Omer is a Torah command and it just happens to go inside with the period of time where the disciples of Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva's Talmidim died, his, his disciples died. Okay. So, what, obviously there's something we want to take out of this. And, and that is what we want to speak about tonight a little bit. The idea of there's a, uh, a, a Mishnah in uh, Pirkei Avos. Pirkei Avos is loosely translated as Chapters of the Fathers, which is not a great cha- translation for Pirkei Avos, by the way. Not the chapters, it's more the instructions of the fathers who are the teachers of Klai Yisrael, teachers of the Jewish people. In Pirkei Avos, the Mishnah says, Yehi kavod chavrecha chavivalecha kishalach. Your friend's honor should be beloved to you like your own. Every individual they ever meet in your life, and this is true, every person you ever meet has a little voice inside. If you listen closely and you're sensitive, everybody you ever meet has a little voice inside that says, respect me. Everybody wants to be respected. Sometimes they, how they communicate that is different ways of communicating, but ultimately everybody wants to be respected. Respect over here doesn't mean put them up on a pedestal and make him a dinner. Respect just means, as an individual, as a person, I would like somebody, I, wa- I want to be respected, just like you want to be respected. I want you to listen to me, don't interrupt me when I speak, which is uh, a challenge for most husbands, I agree with you. Don't interrupt me when I speak, and laugh at my jokes, that's a bigger challenge for husbands. And all the things that a person wants when he's, when, when, when in self-respect, I just want you to respect me. So the Mishnah in Pirkei Ovo says, 
Your friend's dignity, kavod over here, means your friend's respect, your self-respect should be beloved to you just like your own, just like you want to be respected. So your friend also wants to be respected. Then look what the Mishnah follows with. Then it follows with, your friend's respect should be beloved to you like your own. Then the next line is, do not be easily angered. Do not be easily angered. When a person gets angry, the sky's the limit. A person gets angry, everything goes. And therefore the Mishnah says that if you want a formula, Rabbi Akiva's disciples, they died of a plague, 24,000 disciples. Why did they die? Because there was lack of respect between them. There was lack of, lack of they were, did not respect each other the way we were meant to. So again, for us, their level, it was probably very, very subtle. But the lesson we're supposed to take during, during Svirus Omer, what we're looking for during Svirus Omer, is try to apply that lesson to our life. So let's see what we can do with that. The, uh, there was a, uh, an interesting halachic shayla that came. A shayla is a question, a halachic uh, 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 question that came to a halachic authority. The question was like this. There's a young man who was doing outreach in the south of Israel. And he would go down there, and there were young Jews, and he would try to teach them and reach out to them and so on and so forth. And then one day he was driving around in the south of the country, and uh, a siren, an alarm went off because a missile was coming in from Gaza. So he quickly started driving off the side of the road, and he ran into a shelter to, in order to hide. And as he drove off the side of the road to get into his shelter, he killed the dog. It was a dog. Okay. So he runs into the shelter, and then when he comes out of the shelter, the family of the dog accosted him. And they said, you know what? You killed the dog. How could you do that? You should have watched where you're going. He said, listen, there was a missile coming after I didn't do it on purpose. He said, how could you do that? Now, most people, if you do something, imagine somebody, somebody accusing you of something that you know, I didn't do anything wrong, I had to get out of there, my life was in danger. The guy goes driving off the side of the road, kills the dog, and the family starts yelling at him. Now, usually in life when we get yelled at, so we yell back. When somebody gets aggressive with us, we get aggressive back. This guy, instead of getting upset, instead of getting angry, he followed the family to their home, went into the home with the family, sat down, and he started talking to them. He befriended the family. The family had a very, very nice home. They're a very well-to-do family. He came back the next week, and again, he befriended them, spoke to them, and slowly but surely, because of his soft cell, because he didn't get upset, they got religious. They became committed to Judaism. And after they gave community to Judaism, they said to them, listen, we respect what you're doing, your outreach efforts over here. We have a very big home, and we have a massive, they had apparently a massive extra room that they took. They said, you know what, we want to turn this into a shul. We want to make it a shul, and you'll have a study area where you could bring in your students and you could teach them and you could, you could study Judaism with them. We only have one condition. We want to name the shul after the dog. The dog died. And we, you know, usually you name a shul, you dedicate the shul to somebody, you got Uncle Al, you know, or whatever the name of the shul is. We want to call the shul, uh, we want to dedicate the shul to the dog. The dog's name was Igor. And we would like to call the shul Base Igor. That's what they said. They want to call it Base Igor. So they went to uh, Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein, Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein, Rav Yashif Sadalon, they asked Rav Yitzhak Zilberstein, can we name the shul after the dog, you know? And uh, yet, you know, it's normal, it's very normal in shuls, you always get people barking at the gabai, but over here it was going to be a little, a little more, a little more serious, a little more literal, and he goes to, you know, can we name the shul after the dog? So Rav Zilberstein actually cited a proof from the Talmud. There is a story in the Talmud of a Jew who bought, who had a, a Jew he had an ox, and he sold the ox to a non-Jew. And when he sold the ox to the non-Jew, the ox, when a Jew has an animal, the animal is not allowed to do work on Shabbos. The same Shabbos limitations, the restrictions, you're not allowed to have your animal, the animals have to rest on Shabbos also. So the animals, while we eat shalt, the animals also have, somebody even asked the rabbi once if you're supposed to give the animals oneg Shabbos, give them special food for Shabbos. These are interesting questions. It's fun to be a rabbi. You know, you get all the good, the rabbanim get all the good questions. And, and he asked, so, so the Jew sold the, the ox to the non-Jew, and the ox refused to do work. So the non-Jew said to the Jew, hey, what's going on here? I bought an ox to work for six days. He gave me a deal. For seven days, he only worked six days. So the Jew went to the ox. He said, listen, when you were with me, you had a day off. Now you're with him. The mitzvahs don't apply to you anymore. You have to work. And the ox started working. Well, the non-Jew was so impressed that he converted to Judaism. And he's called Rabbi Yonasan, Rabbi Yochanan Turta. Rabbi Yochanan Turta. Turta is the Aramaic word for the ox. He's named in honor of the ox. He's called Rabbi Yochanan Turta. 
And therefore, Rabbi Zilbershade said, if you could name a Tana after an ox in honor of an ox, you could name a shul in honor of the dog. There is a shul somewhere in Israel called, uh, uh, what do you call it? There's a shul called uh, Beis Igor. There's a shul called Beis Igor, you know, somewhere, somewhere in Israel. So if you're ever in the south of Israel, you're looking for a minion. <laughs> you're missing a man. <laughs> we only have nine. We need a, ten, a center, you know, the tenth man for the minion. So it could be that you're going to get these, uh, they have a Beis Igor. Then he was asked another question, this little boy whose dog died. And he wanted to know if he could, this is totally unrelated to our subject, but it's an interesting question. He wanted to know if he could learn, you know, there's a, there's a tradition, he learned Mishnayis Le'ilui Nishmas, you know, for his merit for the soul of the deceased. He wanted to know if he could learn Mishnayis Le'ilui Nishmas, a dog. You know, could he learn Mishnayis? That, he said, that, that, that you already can't do. You know, pick a Mishnah that starts with a Dalit and a Vav and a Gimel, you know, as a dog, you know, and learn Mishnayis. So that he said, that he said he can't do. So... It's interesting. Here you have here you have a classic example. What would have happened if this young man who ran over the dog unintentionally, he was life threatening situation. What if he would have gotten angry? What if he would have gotten upset? What would have happened? He would have yelled. They would have yelled at him. He would have yelled back at them. I was once walking in Israel. I saw this with my own eyes. I was in a bookstore, and I heard a noise. And uh, I heard fighting outside. I heard yelling. So. Uh, I walked outside to see what was going on. Two guys, grown men, theoretically, were fighting over a parking space. They were arguing over a parking space. And one of the guys said to the other one in Hebrew, he looked at him, he pointed and said, Ata tipesh. So the guy said, which means you're stupid. The guy said to him, Ata tipesh yotergadol. He said, you're a bigger stupid. He said, Ata tipesh achigadol bekola ir. Right, so the guy stepped back, did some serious thinking. Right? And he steps forward, he says, Tati call Medina, the whole country. Right? And I'm watching this, and they're going back, and I've seen this with my kids, you know, where kids come over to me. I had this when my kids were younger. One kid comes running in the room. Daddy, he called me a poopy. He used to say to my kid, little three-year-old comes, a four-year and a half-year-old called, he, she called me a poopy. I say, tell her, she's a poopy doopy. And the kid goes scrampling off, and I says, you're a poopy doopy. And the other one, four and a half-year-old comes in, he says, she called me a poopy doopy. I said, okay, tell her she's a poopy, a, ser- a super poopy doopy, right? And, then, and this would go on. And it became, I think it became, we got up to supersonic poopy doopy. I don't remember what we got to. And I saw these guys arguing. You know, people use an expression, would you guys stop behaving like a couple of children? It's a mistake. It's a mistake. The expression should be, can you please stop behaving like a couple of adults? Right? And eventually it got to the point these guys were smiling at each other because they realized how ridiculous they look. They, they actually were, 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 were smiling. So a person understands if he would have reacted that way, if he would have, let's say he would have gotten angry. So all of the benefits for his organization, for his operation, he would have lost everything because of that temporary, that momentary anger. That's, what the, that's the idea. When a person gets angry, you lose any sort of sense of proportion. In some homes, if you have a situation, sometimes the husband yells and the wife goes over to close the window. Right? That, that often happens. Husband starts yelling, wife closes the window. I was actually giving a talk once, and I mentioned that. And a woman says, oh, it's not like that in my home. In my home, I yell, my husband closes the window. She actually said that, she actually said that in public, by the way. Why, 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 I'm not sure. But she, oh, oh, now I respect you more. So you understand when you get upset, you start yelling, your wife's embarrassed, your kids might be embarrassed, and you don't care. Because at that point, you just don't care. That's what the mission is saying. The mission is saying, be careful with other people's dignity. And then it follows with, don't get angry. Because when you get angry, you cut loose. When you get angry, everything flies. The classic example, classic example of what a person, thank you very much, what a person could lose when a person gets angry. So everybody has heard of King David, David HaMelech, King David. And King David is now, you know, we have the, the David HaMelech, David HaMelech, Yisrael Chai V'Kayim. We're always talking about David HaMelech. The Nach is full of David HaMelech, King David. He had an older brother. His older brother was named Eliov. David, for the history anybody knows, was the youngest son of Yishai. When Shmuel Anavi, the prophet Samuel, when Shmuel Anavi came to anoint him, God said, go anoint a son of Yishai. So if you look at the story, he goes and he sees Eliav. Eliav is the oldest brother, a fine specimen. And Shmuel is convinced that that's going to be the new king. He's about to anoint him. And God comes to him prophetically and says, no, 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 that's not the one I, I have not chosen him. And he's rejected. Now, what happened? Why did Aliyah, the Aliyah could have been the king, and then the Messianic, the entire Messiah process would come from Aliyah. Now it doesn't. It's taken away and it's given to Dodonov. What happened? So what happened was they had gone out to the battlefront. 
All seven brothers went to the battlefront. The youngest brother, David, was sent by his father to go visit the other brothers. And he goes out there to the battlefront to bring them food, provisions, and check on them. And Eliav, the oldest brother, turns on David and he says to him, what are you doing out here? You came here to see the action? You got, you got bored? You came out here to see the action? And he got angry at him. Because of that temporary, because of that moment of anger, he was taken away. He lost the entire kingdom and the entire, everything that we have that comes from David would have come from Eliav. He lost it because he got angry. That's what the Chazal say. That's what the Talmud says. What does that mean? What does that mean? So there's an interesting statement. Talmud says, Anybody gets angry, so if you get angry, even if you were meant to rise to a position of prominence, you lose it when you get angry. A person could have been destined to rise to a position of prominence. They got angry, they lose what they were destined to have. That's what the Gemara says. Why? Why? So we think in terms of, we always think in terms of, well, you're punished. You got angry, so you got punished. It's not a punishment. It's not a punishment. It's a direct consequence because when you get angry, you show that you're not qualified. Eliav got angry. When you get angry, your emotions took over. By letting your emotions take over, you've demonstrated that you're not qualified to be the king. You cannot have, imagine nowadays, imagine a president or imagine a king who has a bad day and therefore sets off a nuclear attack. And he's in a bad mood. You woke up in the morning, you're not feeling well, so you set off a nuclear attack. You're not qualified. We can't have you being governed by your emotions. The definition of a king is somebody who rules over, not only you rule over other people, you rule over other people is the easiest thing in the world. The real definition of a king is you rule over yourself. If your emotions are governing how you respond, so then you're not qualified to be a king. So the Talmud is telling us it's not a punishment, you're not being punished, but if you're out of control and you can't control yourself, you will lose your position that you were destined to, you were destined to a position of prominence, and you're gonna lose that position simply because you cannot control yourself, because we cannot have somebody with a finger on the bomb if they're a person who is out of control, a person who cannot control their emotions. There's a, uh, a uh, uh, apocryphal story is told about a king, uh, a prince and a princess. Some of you have heard this. A prince and a princess are living in the palace and everything is wonderful. They're living together, wonderful, terrific harmony. And there's only one problem. The princess is a slob. She never cleans up. The palace is always a mess. It's a good question. Why didn't they have servants is a good question. It's very good. I don't know. It's only a story. And uh, so the princess never cleans up, and they, the prince is losing patience. And then one day he says to the princess, uh, listen, um, I've had enough, and you're going to have to start cleaning up the palace, or you're going to be in trouble. And she's lying on the couch reading a magazine. She said, no, nah, I don't really want to. So he goes into the kitchen. He comes out with a very big cookie. He says, so look, I'm going to eat this cookie. By the time I eat this cookie, if you haven't started cleaning up, I'm banishing you from the palace. So she's just sitting there flipping pages, and he takes his cookie, and he starts eating. And every couple of bites, he looks at her, and she's just relaxed on the couch. And he finishes the cookie. After he finishes the cookie, so they're going to start cleaning up. She says, no. He says, guards, banish her. So the guards go over, and they toss her out of the palace. All right, the next day, he regrets what he's done. He loves his princess. He wants her back. The problem is there's a law in the land that once you banish a princess, you can't take her back. So now he's got his, he's, he's stuck, he wants his princess back. So he calls in the first wise man, and he says to him, listen, get me out of this. You know, I, I banished her, but I really want her back. The wise man says, sorry, Excellency, there's a law on the land, can't take her back. Calls the second wise man, sorry, Excellency, nothing we can do. Calls in the Jewish wise man. The Jewish wise man says to him, was it a hard cookie or a soft cookie? So he says, does that really make a difference? You want to know if there are chocolate chips? I mean, does that really matter? He says, answer my question. He says, well, as a matter of fact, it was a hard cookie. He says, great. If it was a hard cookie, that means there must have been some crumbs. If there were crumbs, that means you never fulfilled the condition. You said when you finished a cookie, you'll banish her. You never finished a cookie, so you could take her back. So there are two very important lessons here, ladies. Number one, lesson number one, always bake hard cookies. That's lesson number one. Lesson number two, lesson number two is that there aren't always crumbs left to pick up. Sometimes a person could cause so much damage, whether it's in a relationship, whether it's in an organization, whether it's in some other area of life, where because of their anger, there aren't there always crumbs to pick up. So a person has to always be careful, you know, if there are, sometimes you could, sometimes you could get out of it. But often it happens, often it happens in life that you just went a little bit too far 
and you got upset, and you said something you shouldn't have said, and even afterwards, you like politicians, well, my words were take out, taken out of context. Every heard a politician say, guy politician gets up, he says, well, I think he's an incompetent fool. You know, and then they say, well, a poli you, take, you, know, you can't say that. He says, okay, my words were taken, I take it back. You didn't take, you took it back. Yeah, yeah. You said he's an incompetent, my words were taken out of context. Really? Yeah. The real context was, he's a major incompetent fool. That's what the real, but my words were taken out of context. Okay, so you pop, we heard you. You can't take it back. We, we heard it. It, it the, the damage is done. So a person understands that if you analyze what anger is, what, what is, a, let's talk a little, what, what is anger? So they had a, uh, um, um, a uh, the foolishness of people who get angry. I had a student who went to somebody's house once for a meal. A young couple was married. Went to this meal, and he's sitting at the table with them at a meal, just the three of them. And uh, the husband and the wife, a young couple, they were married for a short time, about 45 or 50 years. And uh, they were actually in their first year of marriage. And he was sitting there at the table with them. And they had a fight. They had an argument at the table. So the wife served the gefilte fish. The husband said something about, like, is the fish on a salt-free diet? And she said something, well, only sweet people can taste salt. You know, something like that. And they started going at it. And they actually started yelling at each other. And he's sitting there. The guest is sitting there. And they started yelling at each other, getting upset. And after they finished yelling at each other, they stopped completely. They, they just sat there quietly. And he's sitting there for about 10, 15 minutes, nobody's saying a word. It's very uncomfortable, you can imagine. And at a certain point, he suddenly jumps up. The guest jumps up. He does like this. <laughs> So they looked at it, they both looked at it and said, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm, I'm just cutting the tension. Right? And, and, you know, and, then every, you know, and then the wife, I remember he told me that the wife said to him, when you're married, you better not do anything like that. And I'm not sure why. I'm not, I'm not quite sure why. You just say what happens. The person gets angry. You say what you look like. You say what you make yourself. So they say, in, if you ever want to control your anger, one of the ideas what that's given for a person to control their anger is when you're, having a, when you're having a temper tantrum, go look in the mirror. Go look at it. What, look what you look like. Just, just stay far away that you're not in punching range of the mirror. But move back. Get a look at yourself in the mirror. When you get a look at what you look like in the mirror, you see how foolish you look. Then you understand. Then you understand what it's like. What 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 other people see. The same way we see other people. Ever see a two-year-old having a temper tantrum? I bet you a two-year-old has a temper tantrum all the time. They have temper tantrums, right? What makes you think they look any worse than adults? Right? You have a father who walks into the room and starts yelling at his son, don't you yell in this house! Right? And then he wonders why his son is trying to hold back a smirk. Right? And the, father, the father's yelling at him not to yell. You understand what it makes you look like? So the whole, idea, the whole idea of, I was once typing one of my books I was in the middle of writing, and I have a loose leaf notebook at home. True story, I have a loose leaf, that doesn't mean the other stories aren't true, but this one is certainly true. This one I know, it happened to me. And I was in the middle of typing, and I left my head a loose leaf notebook, which I left right by in front of the computer. And I got up, and I w did whatever I did. I came back into the room, and I could tell that little seven-year-old fingers had been touched. Somebody's had been fiddling with my notebook, which my kids at home know is absolutely off limits. You know, they're, 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 no one touches daddy's notebook. And I, you know, and I sat down, and as I sat down. I started saying, you know, in an unpleasant and louder than usual voice, I started saying, who's been touching my notebook? And then I looked down at my notebook. I was in the middle of typing up a section of stories on anger. <laughs> so now I had another story. I had another story. So, so you understand, you understand, I'll tell you, uh, uh, what in, uh, this is also true. I'm not proud of this, I'm only saying. Uh, I, when I started writing a column for the Hamodia newspaper, so I started writing a column on Chinuch. And so the lady called me up from Hamodia and asked me to start writing about Chinuch. So I said to her, you know, um, okay. And I told my wife that they called me from Hamodia to write about Chinuch. So my wife said to me, well, what qualifies you to write about Chinuch? I said, well, they're paying. So I said, okay, you know, okay, go for it, you know. So I started writing this column. I was writing for about a year and a half about all sorts of wisdom that I was imparting about how to raise children. And then one night I came in, it was about late, about five to 10, I came in, I had a rough day, I walked into the house and something happened. I think I was missing one of my slippers 
and then somebody said something, I don't know, and then I just exploded. It had a good old-fashioned, all-American temper tantrum. I gotta be careful, this is on, on, on film, but it was, it's on film in heaven also, and Shemayim too. So I, and I had an uh, all-American temper tantrum, and door slamming, yelling, hollering, and also the kids, it's very effective, by the way. They're all of a sudden, they're flossing, and they're doing homework, and they're going to sleep, and okay, house is quiet, and then I had to go off to Davin Marv. So I walk off to Shul to go say the evening prayers, Davin Marv, and a nice Kavona de Marv it was, and I go off to Shul, and then I came back about 20 minutes later, and the house is quiet, and my wife, is sitting there on the couch, and she's trying to suppress a smirk. You can tell she's trying to she, she's she's trying to hold back a smile. So I walked in, I looked, I said, "What's so funny?" So she says to me, "Well, after you left, Plony, at the time our ten-year-old son, uh, after you walked out to shul, you stormed out to shul. He turned to me and he said, and he writes about chinuch, right? So you could you understand how silly a person could look." A person, you get angry, you're totally out of control. And then you've left the trail, you become a Mr. Magoo. You, become a, you leave a trail of disaster. The, um, that's, the, that, that's the general outline of it. Now, there are things that on a personal level we suffer from. And I think probably the most difficult character trait that any person suffers from, the single most difficult character trait, what we call kina, which is roughly translated as envy. There are different traits that every human being has to grapple with. Ego, anger, anger is really a subcategory of ego. Physical desires, all of the things that we try to, all the things that we want to do. Probably the single most difficult meter, the single most difficult trait for a person to battle with is the trait of envy. When you're envious of somebody else, you feel that it's eating your kish gives out. Isn't that true? You could feel it. You could feel it. there's actually a verse that says Rikav. Atzmos kina. Rekav atzmos kina means, it's a verse in, in Proverbs. Rekav atzmos kina means that envy causes your bones to rot. That a person feels, when, you, when you're jealous of somebody else, when you're jealous of somebody else, you actually feel that it's eating you up inside. People could get ulcers by becoming jealous of other people. Isn't that true? You, you know how it eats you up inside. You know what jealousy really is? You know what jealousy really is? One of the commentaries says, the definition of jealousy means you're angry at God for the way he's running his world. That's really what it is. Jealousy is your own anger, and it's your anger triggered at God, not at other people. I can't be angry at somebody else if he's more talented, somebody else has got a better ability. I can't be angry at him. So who are you angry at? You're angry at God for giving that person the ability. Ladies, didn't it ever bother you that there's a lady on the block who's great at cake design? Did it ever bother you? There's one lady who does cake design, and it always comes out perfect. Never bothered you? And your cake always somehow comes out the, a little bit lopsided, and the green frosting melts, right? It never comes out. You put it in the freezer. Somehow it, it sweats. It melts. It doesn't bother you. It bothers the kishkas out of some people, right? What, what, what she, and she, this lady stays up till 2 in the morning, and almost like, you know, next thing you know, you got something that looks like a painting from Picasso. And she brings out this cake. It doesn't, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't eat you up. It eats you alive. So it, people are just, when you're jealous, you don't have that ability. You don't have that talent. That just means you're angry at a kosher Baruch Hu. You're angry at God that God gave the talent, the ability, to somebody else. Men, see, by ladies, it's cake. By men, it's usually money. Right? We're, we're more, much more tachlis oriented. You know, let's get down to the brass tacks. If you're living in a more competitive society, it has to do with cars. I was just in, Amer I was just in a place, a guy drives a Maserati, which is better than a Subaru, in case you don't know. He drives a Maserati and he buys a new one each year, right? And now there was nothing wrong. I saw the I saw the, the current model. It looked pretty good, you know, no problem. And he buys a new one each year. So you know, a man who's struggling, a man who would like to move up, it you're jealous. It eats you up. What you're really doing is you're upset. You're angry at God for the way God runs His world. That's what's really bothering you. So the the nature of anger is such that if a person loses control, the person loses control, so then they're, they're, they're not qualified. Because if you lose control, you could cause a lot of damage. Now, it's very interesting. Everybody knows in the Torah, there's a remarkable insight into what we really are capable of. Have you ever use the expression, she gets me so angry. He gets me so angry. Did you ever use that expression? He gets me angry. 
right? That's what people generally blame other people for getting them angry, which to a certain extent is true. I, I don't say that it's, that it's not always true. I've had even said it to my own family, you know, once in a while, you know, I get upset. Let's say, imagine, it doesn't happen often, maybe the last time it happened was 15 years ago or so, father gets upset. Why am I upset again? I walk into the house, somebody took my slipper. The daddy starts getting upset. So a child says, Daddy, why are you getting upset? We shouldn't get angry. I say to the child, listen, you're upset because I'm not controlling myself. If you would control yourself and not take my slippers, control your selfishness and your laziness to run upstairs and get your own slippers, if you would work on yourself, then I wouldn't have to work on myself. Isn't that true? Then I could turn around and say, well, that child is getting me upset. That person is getting me upset. But the truth of the matter is, that person is not getting you upset. That person is putting you into a state of test. Somebody once said, when you drive in Israel especially, when you drive in Israel, after you get out of your car, if you've driven, you are going to be a different person. You will either be a better person or you'll be a worse person, but you're not gonna be the same person. They, they, that's certainly not true. You're not gonna be the same person. Now, is it because you changed, did they change me or I changed me? Did they change me or I changed me? An interesting question. So let's examine this a little bit. I heard about a couple. They were sitting in a house after shul, one Shabbos. The husband and the wife were in the house, and they're sitting in the house. It was after, you know, after shul, the husband came home, and the family isn't always ready to sit down and start eating. So the husband is sitting in the room, and he's studying, he's learning Torah. The wife is finishing up her prayer, davening, and uh, her, their 10-year-old son is playing with his friend, the neighbor for the 10-year-old boy from next door. So the father's learning, the mother's davening, and the two kids are running around the house playing chase, they're, they're, you know, playing some game, like two little boys running around the house. And they go chasing each other, and they ran through the kitchen, and as they ran through the kitchen, they knocked into the blech, the blech is the cover on the fire, knocked into the blech, and they knocked the pot of cholent on the floor. And of course, when cholent, I think, who is it that's what said when it falls, like peanut butter always falls on the side you butter, right? They knock over the cholent pot, boom, on the floor. So the father closes his safer, closes his book, the mother closes her sitter. The two of them walk into the kitchen. They meet in the kitchen, take a broom, take a dust wheel. They clean up the chol, the spilled chol, the potatoes, the carrots, the meat, the whole thing. Sweep it up, put it in a garbage pail. Neither of them says a word. He goes back to his safer. She goes back to her davening. And that's it. So the 10-year-old kid from next door just saw what happened, and he knows that if this had happened in his house... If somebody knocked over the chomp pot in his house, you know, volcanic reactions. So he's looking at this, trying to figure out what just happened. So he says to his friend, oh, I get it. This must happen around here a lot. So they've gotten used to it already. <laughs> the idea that somebody could look at a spilled chomp pot and, they, and, and not get upset about a spilled chomp pot, I mean, you, you can imagine. So what's really getting it? Did, you get him, did they get him angry? Two separate families. In one family, they don't get angry. The other, so are they getting you angry? Or are you allowing yourself to be driven to an emotional state where you're out of control? So where does it come from? So I want to tell you something very interesting. So it's very interesting for those of us who have ever studied the sources, the classic sources. The Torah says that Reuven, Yaakov Avinu, Jacob's oldest son, Reuven. So when Reuven goes and Reuven gets involved in Yaakov's personal life, and as a result, when Yaakov brings his 12 sons in, and he gives them brachas, right? At the end, he gives them brachas, all them brachas. What happens to Reuven? He says to Reuven, Pachas kamayim al tosar. You were impetuous like water, and therefore you will not get the portion you were supposed to get. Reuven is the first person in history who loses what he's supposed to get. What was he supposed to get? Supposed to be the king? Supposed to be the firstborn privileges? He's supposed to be the Kohen. He loses the whole package. Three things. He loses the whole package. Why? Because of his impetuousness. <laughs> you got involved in something you shouldn't got involved in. Pachaz kamayim. You were impetuous like water. Therefore, al tosar, you will not get the extra portions you were meant to get. So I want to ask you a question. Why does it say pachaz kamayim? When you think of something that's impetuous, what would you think of? I wouldn't think of water even though when water storms in, it's out of control, which is one of the comparisons. Water, a flood, a tsunami comes in, 
totally out of control. But why Ruvain, it's not a question of the water being out of control. Pachas Kamayim, I can think of other things. I would say you were impetuous like an upset hippopotamus. Ever see a hippopotamus that's upset? They're very, very difficult to deal with, right? They're very unreasonable. And I would have said you were Pachas Kamayim, you were like a wild animal. It says Pachas, you were impetuous like water. You know what that means? If you take water and you put water in a container, what happens to water? Any container you put it in, the water takes the shape of the container. Put it in a round glass, the water looks round. Put it in a tall, thin glass, the water looks tall and thin. Put it in a square flower holder, the water takes a square shape, right? Water takes the shape of whatever container you put it in. Yaakov Avinu is saying to Ruvain, Pachaz Kamayim, you are shaped by circumstances. And because you're shaped by circumstances, you can't be the king. Pachas Kamayim. The same way that water is shaped, you're being shaped. A king does the shaping. A king does not get shaped. A king is the one who makes the determination. A king isn't the one who other people make determinations about him. You follow the difference. You hear the difference. Ruvain, you're disqualified. Why? Because you allow yourself to be shaped. You allow yourself, the emotional response is a totally emotional response. You are being shaped by circumstances. A king is somebody who rises above it. They came once to the stipler. Somebody came to the stipler. Now the stipler, if you know anything about the stipler, people used to come, the great rabbi, people used to come into him and they would ask for blessings, they would ask for advice, they would ask for brachas, and every once in a while somebody would ask him, and a stipler would yell. Somebody would come in and he would yell. And that was his response. And they once asked him, why do you yell at people? So the discipler said, you know, there are certain people who you obviously can't reason with. They will not listen. He could tell right away they will not accept a reasonable explanation or response to their question. And therefore, once in a while, it's like, you, know, you just need shock treatment. And he said, I hope it works. So the guy once came to him and asked him a question. I don't remember what the question was. It was about doing something that was pretty extreme. So he came into the discipler. And he said to the sniper, those of you who ever gone in to see him, I remember I saw him twice in my life, he went in, he sat there at his table, he could barely see, he could barely hear, yet you could feel the, feel the Kedusha, feel the, the Kedusha radiating from him, the holiness, and he, people would go in. And so this guy comes in, and he asks the stipler his question about this radical behavior. And the stipler takes a look at the note, he used to see he couldn't hear, so you had to give him a note, and he would look at the note, and then he would give you a response. The stipler picks up the note, and he looks at it, he goes, No! Lol! In Hebrew, Lol! So the guy, the guy looks at it, he's scared. He turns to say, he says, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to get the great rabbi angry. So the stipler smiles and says, I'm not angry. You're not allowed to get angry. That means you could yell without getting angry. Isn't that interesting? You can yell. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> doesn't work. Do you know that there's a law, there's a halacha, you're not allowed to spank your kids out of anger? You're not allowed to patch your kids if you're angry. I don't know, by mothers it's different because by mothers you don't even patch, you just kind of grab and twist, right? Isn't that about, you just grab whatever, especially with little boys, anything you could catch, you grab. You know, I remember my mother grabbing you by the ear, you know, then marching you up the stairs to your room to go clean up under the bed. You are going to walk up there. You know, the mother grits her teeth. Every single mother, I, I think women have jaw trouble because of that, because they can't control. You are going to. A ha father, a father wants to spank his child. Do you know that the halacha is? A father's not allowed to spank out of anger. Not allowed to patch your child out of anger. If you hit a child out of anger, it's no different than just going over to you and striking him. You're not to hit a child out of anger. When you hit a child, you spank a child because you have to teach him what to do, it's got to be done calm and patient. My kids are here, so I don't want to say too much about the subject, but you could ask them. But when a father he has to take the child, say to the child, okay, here we go. You're going to get four, five, six, whatever amount the father decides, 613. However, however many spanks, and then you give it to him, and you have to give it calmly, because if you get angry, then it's just striking for the sake of striking. That you're not allowed, that you're not allowed to do. There is a, um, beyond anger, this whole idea of being a king extends to all areas of self-control. That means that whether it has to do with, it has to do with uh, um, um, your mouth, person's mouth. Somebody once said, a closed mouth gathers no feet. 
person has to know the idea of self-control, of being a king, applies in all areas of our life. There was a couple that uh, married about six, seven years, did not have any children. They went to speak to a doctor, fertility expert. The wife had gone, had gone through the various tests. They went to speak to a fertility expert. They had been working with the couple. The couple were sitting there, and the wife went in. The husband waited in the waiting room, and the doctor sits down with the wife at the table, and he pulls out the file, and he says to her, listen, I've been through the file, I've been through all the tests, we got the test results. I'm sorry to tell you you're never going to have children. His wife is sitting there. Okay, she just heard devastating news. Finishes with the doctor. She walks out into the waiting room. Her husband, who was a Rosh Hashiva, it's happened in the United States, said, what did the doctor say? She looked at her husband. She said, he said, everything is going to be fine. Could you imagine what a king that is, a queen, the self-control, because she doesn't want to get her husband upset? The end of the story was they ended up with nine children or 11 children. I'm not sure how many it was. And it could very well be it was in the merit of her self-control. I don't know. That I can't say. But one thing is clear. A person realizes the idea that they are in control, they are a king, and they don't just lash out. One of the great rabbis was Rabbi David Pavarsky from the Ponovich Yeshiva. Rabbi David Pavarsky once had to, he, he broke his elbow or his arm, I'm not sure what it was. He goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, we're going to have to put a sling on your arm. So Rabbi David Pavarsky says, I don't want you to put a sling on my arm. He says, well, we have to, your arm has to be immobilized because of the break. We have to put a sling on it. You can't move your arm. So Rabbi Pavarsky said, okay, so I won't move my arm. So the doctor said, to him, yeah, yeah, but you can't move your arm all day long. You can't move your arm. He said, okay, so I won't move my arm. So he said, yeah, well, that's not going to work because then you can't move your arm at night either while you're sleeping. So he said, so I won't move it while I'm sleeping. Right? Now, we usually think of sleep as an exercise where, you know, you kind of get into bed and touch every part of the mattress. And, you know, it's a, it's a major, major deal over there. And there's an idea of even in the course of the day, we just move our body parts all over the place. If you ever look at great rabbis, they're very, very contained. They almost move their heads slowly. They're not, we're, we're usually, you know, we're all over, all over with all, all limbs flying. The idea of being a melech means you rule over your body as well. And you can rule over your body at night while you're sleeping. I mean, we're talking about major levels, talking about very high levels. But the idea of being a king means you're a king always. One last point I want to make here. Yosef Atzadik. Joseph, if you will. Yosef Atzadik. So he goes down to Egypt. They've even made a movie out of it, so the whole thing must be true. And, uh, you know, Yosef goes down to Egypt, and he is appointed as the viceroy. Of, he's essentially the second most powerful man in the world. Now, if you're an Egyptian minister, just imagine an Egyptian minister... And he sees somebody getting appointed. Could you imagine a country where they take somebody and suddenly appoint him defense minister above all other ministers? Could you imagine such a thing happening? <laughs> we don't have to imagine. We live it every day. So imagine Yosef is, here's this 30-year-old kid, and they appoint him as the viceroy. He is the second most powerful man in the world. So the Egyptian ministers were not that happy. You know, why is he being promoted above us? They came to Paro. You know what Paro said to them? He said to them, I've appointed him because Ginune Malchus ani roebo. The Talmud says, I see he's got royal tendencies. He's got royal characteristics. That's why I appointed him. Now, on a plain level, plain meaning, Ginune Malchus means... You know how to, you know, when you go to see the Queen of England, they have to give you a training course before you go into see the Queen. Is that right? Uh, when you walk in and you're supposed to curtsy and what you do and you never shake hands with the Queen and you never grab the Queen, as certain first ladies have done. You don't touch the Queen. Certain things that you don't do. There's Ginune Malchus. There's a royal, there's a way, there's a whole protocol. Paro says, I see in Yosef Ginune Malchus. I see he's got royal tendencies. At a plain meaning, that means that Yosef obviously has the royal tendencies. But the commentaries explain it's more than that. You know what Ginune Malchus means? Who was Yosef? What did Yosef do? Yosef is the man in the Torah 
who exhibits the greatest level of self-control in the most trying ordeal, the most trying challenge that a man can have, and Yosef overcomes it. That means Yosef's a real king. Ginune Malchus means, I see that he's got royal tendencies. I see that he's got the ability to rule over himself. If you could rule over yourself, you could rule over a nation. If a person's got Ginune Malchus, you could control yourself, now you could be, you're qualified to be the king. Yosef's greatest qualification to be the king is not his publicity campaign, and it's not his campaign manager. His greatest qualification to become the king is what Yosef does in a back room where nobody else sees him. That's the greatest qualification of a king. In our day and age, we live in a world where there's so much publicity, and we think of the people who run the world as the people who had the greatest publicity and the greatest, and sometimes these are the people who are most out of control. They are the least qualified. They don't have to look too far beyond the American elections. Sometimes the people least qualified are the people who are the ones who are going to be most involved in the, in the process. In Torah, it's completely different. You know what makes you a king? What makes you a king is what you do in the privacy of your own home. What you do alone determines whether or not you're a king. And that the king of kings sees. That's okay, Kosh Rochu sees. Kosh Rochu sees who the king is. So when Sfirosa Omer comes, and we're working and concerned about man-to-man -man interpersonal relationships, the person has to remember that our interpersonal relationships are dependent on our self-control, on our taking control of ourselves, which we're, we're able to do. We can't turn around and say, he gets me angry, she ticks me off, this upsets me. That we can too. When it comes to spirit sober, it comes to interpersonal relationships, the person has to say, listen, whatever you're doing, that's your business. You're accountable. You took my slippers, you took my parking space, the ultimate, the ultimate crime. You took my parking space. Whatever you did to me, that was your choice. How am I going to respond? That's my choice. And I can't turn around and say, well, you did something. You pushed me over the edge. You pushed yourself over the edge. My goal is to not be allowed myself to push over the edge. If a person forces himself to not be pushed over, then a person is a king. If you're a king, you rule over yourself. You rule over yourself, then you're going to your relationships with other people are going to be a relationship of respect. You're controlling yourself. And then you've got the message from Rabbi Akiva and his disciples what we're supposed to take out of Sir Silver. Okay.